Casey, my name is Christopher Lewis from the Pueblo Azuni, member of the Badger Clan, child to the corn. Besides being a fiber artist, which means I work with grasses, uh, strings, textiles, uh, feathers, and I do feather work and stuff. I'm also a member of Cedar Mesa Perishables Project. The unique thing about that is uh, I get to see a lot of prehistoric artifacts that uh, I get my inspiration from. Uh, today, we're going to talk about, demonstrate some things with narrow leaf yucca, which is this, this plant here. It's a, in the wild, it's a nice looking plant, but fairly deadly if you're not used to working with it. <laughs> this one's uh, kind of cleaned up so it doesn't look too bad. Before we get started, when you get a plant, uh, go out, give our prayers, our offerings to one of them to, to continue growing for us to keep using. After all of these plants we gather are not collected with any modern tools. We don't use knives, axes, picks, shovels to collect. Do it all by hand. And to get started, uh, we just take um, the, the each leaf and have to separate it from the base. We have to find out how they lay after getting this all taken apart with what we need. You have to um, go back and clean all of these leaves by hand all the way down. Because if you try and weave with these little things in, they're like needles that will stick in your, your hands, your fingers and they have um, like a cactus spine, they have barbs on them so when you try to pull them out they'll keep breaking and any pressure you put on it it uh, causes a lot of pain. So you have to carefully clean them all off all the way, each and every single one that you're going to use. Normally I won't use freshly picked yucca to do this uh, particular project. Uh, I wait uh, a day or so. Uh, this I, I picked a few hours ago, so it's still really fresh. Uh, what I'm going to um, be working on today is a plated pot rest. Um, this kind of looks a little off, a little wonky, but it's the very first one I made. This is the one that has all my knowledge in it. So, um, and this smaller one, this particular one, is a family piece, and it's probably around 80 years old. So it's a, an older, older one. Uh, history of pot rest go, goes back to uh, basket maker time, several thousand years. In the beginning, you, you found, uh, in the collections I look at, with Cedar Mesa perishables, uh, we see a lot of pot rests. Uh, a lot of them we see are just rings of um, juniper bark tied with uh, yucca or um, juniper bark uh, wrapped with yucca, juniper bark wrapped with um, sumac bark or Utah service berry bark. A lot of different ways they were made and uh, why there were so many uh, pot rests made with ready available stuff was prehistorically all the pottery was round bottom. They weren't um, flat bottom like they are today. So they needed a pot rest to sit in so they wouldn't tip over or roll over. So you, if you see a lot of different plant materials used for pot rest. Uh, juniper bark being the most common. Uh, this type of pot rest or pot ring, you see a lot, but then they would attach this to the bottom of the pot and build a yucca harness up the side of the pot so it was attached to the pot itself. So you see a lot of these ones. Another one is um, the uh, corn husk rings. So they'll take bundles of corn husk and wrap corn husk around the outside to make a a ring 
and you'd, you'd see a lot of these uh, rings uh, in different sizes in a different shape. But some of the most unique ones were yucca twine. The, the yucca uh, fibers were twisted into a cordage and then made into a ring um, for smaller pots. Now the plated pot um, rests that uh, we're going to be working on are um, from the Pueblo III period. That uh, About 900 to 1200 years ago they were uh, being made more heavily during that time. Out of the collections I've looked at, Mesa Verde had the most, uh, that was the most common type of uh, pot rest during that, make, made at that, that uh, location, uh, this pot, um, plated pot rest. Um, this uh, practice continued into Zuni. Uh, about 11 years ago, there was one person left in the village making these pot rests. And um, <clears throat> now we have a, a handful of people that uh, make them. Oh, this is another type of, of pot rest, which was just shredded yucca, wrapped with uh, yucca to, um, uh, to make the, the, the ring. As I'm, I'm working, I'll talk about uh, my tools and other things as, uh, as uh, we go along. It takes a while to clean and process the, the yucca to get it ready, so I already have uh, some of my yucca already done here. Um, and this, uh, this style I'm going to do um, was something typically done in Zuni about a uh, hundred years ago where they took that very thin uh, strip off the back of the yucca, the center. So. And it's just ba uh, a basic um, plating technique of uh, um, uh, weaving it. For me, the hard part of um, doing this is keeping the, the tension on it, the finger strength, the hand strength that's required to, to um, continue doing this and keeping that constant pressure on it. This yucca was picked in Zuni, uh, where I'm from. Uh, it's a narrow leaf yucca, which is part of the lily family. Normally I pick all of my uh, yucca on the reservation, so um, for uh, cultural things we are allowed to pick um, plants and stuff. 
like if I was coming here and uh, I didn't uh, bring the plant from home, I don't know, I wouldn't try picking uh, yucca in Arizona. Because <laughs> I won't know whose property I might be going on or um, the tribe, tribe, if it's another tr uh, tribe I'm visiting. Um, so, it, you always have to be mindful about different things like that um, as a guest. Uh, but yeah, so normally I pick all of my plants, um, yucca, willow, um, only thing, only plant I do pick uh, out of state uh, um, is uh, sumac. But the, the thing with sumac is the place I get my sumac from, from a coil basket tree, from a lady's house. She planted it and uh, wanted it pruned and I gladly said I would because I needed the sumac. So I'll drive, we'll drive uh, four hours for me to go prune a sumac bush. It's uh, been about 15 years that I've uh, been weaving. The, the, the number of people in Zuni that were doing any type of weaving basketry uh, was maybe about three people all of our basketry knowledge had been lost in bits and pieces. Um, through a grant, I was uh, able to, uh, well, I was selected to uh, learn some basketry techniques and stuff, and uh, that uh, uh, led to me uh, learning different techniques that uh, I could bring back to the village and start to revive or basketry. Uh, and I've worked at it for 15 years now. Uh, about 11 years ago, uh, 11, 12 years ago, I started the uh, basket weaver skilled in Zuni, uh, letting, uh, getting uh, different people interested in it, uh, going out and harvesting, uh, processing, uh, learning the different techniques, um, which led to us uh, working with Jim Inote and uh, Curtis Kwam at the Ashiwawa Museum in Zuni. And one of the things um, Curtis had was a broken drum base that was found in the village. He brought that up from storage and you know, he told me, Chris, you're going to get a kick out of this. Look at this. And he put it on the table. I opened up the box, moved the tissue paper, took one look at it and said, I'll be right back. I went home and got my dental tools, gloves, came back, and I studied that thing for a couple hours. The thing was, we were having a work session. So my uh, colleagues were there weaving. Um, we were working on different things. And I sat with that drum bass, trying different things, trying different things. And I got it. I made, I made, this was the first one I made by studying that broken drum bass. From this, all the ladies in there were all saying thank you, thank you, you know, acknowledging that the ancestors didn't want it lost and that they gave that knowledge to me to, to uh, learn it. Uh, so that's, that's where I learned how to, to weave the style I weave. Uh, there's another individual that I know who weaves them. He weaves them in a different manner. And they all come out looking the same. You, uh, you can't tell uh, how they're woven unless you actually sit and watch the weaver mm -hmm. and learn, learn that person's style of, of weaving. 
Uh, that's the unique part of these. There's no right or wrong way to say that um, it's being done this way or that way. And this particular style I'm weaving right now with um, the uh, that tiny strip taken off of it. Two years ago, I I was privileged enough to uh, study uh, prehistoric perishables uh, from Cedar Mesa at the Penn Museum. And during that time, we were there. We were doing. We were going to do a lecture, and uh, was taken uh, taken to the collections. The yucca basket I wove. Uh, we picked um, fourteen hundred year old basket, uh, nine hundred year old basket, and the week old basket I had <laughs> to put on the table during the lecture. And the same with the pot rest. We picked a 900 year old, a 100 year old, and a week old one. But I always made my, my pot rest with a whole leaf. I never really thought about splitting them or anything. So I, I uh, wove them just the way you see it here. But when I was in the basement looking for a Zuni pot rest and came across those hundred year old ones, they had about a dozen pot rests from 1901 to 1916 that were all woven with this tiny piece taken off the back. Mm. And the th other thing I, know I saw in there were uh, the yucca baskets from Zuni and the, the, the mats from Zuni were all done the same way with the tiny strip taken off the back. And that's, that's um, something you see in a lot of prehistoric baskets that uh, thin sliver taken off the entire length of the, the yucca. Now, someone asked, uh, do you use all natural materials or do you use a metal uh, to close the baskets, to close the rings? On my, my, my yucca baskets, uh, sometimes uh, if I'm not, not, not being a, a replica piece, I will use a, a metal ring, but uh, if uh, it's a, a replica basket, then I will use a, a wooden ring. A lot of the times, for smaller baskets, I will use uh, I will use the um, willow rings. I'll go out and cut willow and make um, the rings with them. Uh, the largest ring I make out of willow is probably around a 14-inch basket. After 14 inches for it to be uh, sturdy and durable, uh, then it would be uh, out of um, oak to make the, the bigger baskets to uh, hold up. Um, so once in a while, if it's a contemporary piece or um, something a little different, I will use a, a metal ring on uh, the baskets. Uh, for a plated pot rest, there's no ring involved. It's all just uh, yucca. And you spoke of uh, sumac earlier. What's its use? Uh, sumac, uh, the, the bark, uh, juniper bark or shredded yucca, uh, the bark is taken off and wrapped like this uh, yucca here. The whole thing would just be uh, sumac or service berry uh, um, bark used to wrap the out outside of the, the uh, juniper bark. The, the inside part of the uh, sumac is uh, split into uh, small weavers and uh, is used for the stitching material on uh, a coil basket. This is all uh, uh, 
sumac here uh, that I processed and uh, started this basket with. As a, as a beginner and not having anyone to teach me as a self-learner, you can see all the split stitches in this. And, and um, it was mainly just to see if I could process and start a basket. So, but uh, sumac basketry started, uh, died out a long time ago in Zuni. Um, and one of the things I always say about, about how we lost basketry is that I think it, uh, we started losing it um, due to uh, Spanish influence. Uh, when the Spanish were here, they set, they set restrictions on people and we had a boundary of uh, one mile. The village sat in the middle, so half a mile in any direction, you were not allowed to travel past. So that, that uh, the sumac grows in the higher, higher altitudes, so that was further than the, the one mile limit. So I think that's when we started losing a lot of um, some of our uh, weaving technologies and stuff because of the restrictions of travel and being able to obtain the different uh, plant materials. And um, sumac, uh, sumac leaves, if gathered and dried, uh, the bark is saved. Uh, you can actually boil that. It takes quite a while, uh, several hours of boiling, but you boi boil it and add um, an iron rich clay, a, a lump of red clay to your uh, sumac bath. Um, you get a uh, black dye. And that's uh, normally what um, the black on prehistoric basketry came from, was the, from uh, the sumac dye. That's one of the, the things I want to experiment with is uh, uh, processing the sumac dye, getting it and um, soaking the yucca in it to see if that's how they obtain the black dye on um, the yucca for the color contrast on their, some of their rings, some of the, uh, some of the pot rests, some of the baskets. We haven't figured out what they were using to uh, get that really beautiful uh, deep black on their baskets. And we got another question. Um, are you teaching any younger generations um, how to weave? Uh, I've tried. They, they want, the, a lot of people want to get rich uh, quick, but they don't want to go spend hours walking, looking for plants, processing, doing all that. Uh, but um, I do, that was my goal um, in re, uh, the purpose of starting the Basket Guild and um, working uh, was to revive basketry and, and continue it. With this, uh, I've, I've taught several, several classes in Zuni. I've taught um, individuals. Um, my thing at, at home is if you really, really want to learn, don't ask me. Don't ask me to teach you. I, and I, you know, people look at me and they say, why do you say that? I said, because it's like you're lying to me because you say, I want you to teach me and then I never see you again. I say, if you're serious about it, you want to learn. You know where I live. You know where my door is. You walk through that door and say, I'm here to learn. Then I know you're serious about it. So that's where I stand on that. I tell everybody at home that say, I would really love to learn. I say, you know where the house is. Zunis don't have a tradition of knocking. We go in and announce. <laughs> so that's traditionally, that's how it would be. I'm here to learn. I'm here to, 
It's like, I'm here, I'm here to sit and watch you. We learn by watching. And we got another uh, question about yucca. Um, what's your process of picking it, and what's the safest way to uh, cut it out of the ground? <laughs> <clears throat> Step on it. That's how we, uh, I pick them. I step on it and then you have to gather it together and pull it. And the dangerous thing is you're pulling it directly at your chest. <laughs> so I don't know if that's safe or not, but that's, that's how I learned to collect it. And then when you're done, you um, push the sand back over the, the root. And that, that uh, allows the root to stay, stay moist and you go back the next year or two years, uh, there should be a new uh, uh, shoot that has grown up from it. And I never pick uh, yucca in the same place. I, I, uh, uh, then you, if you find uh, large clumps of yucca, you... Um, I only pick uh, one or two, depending on the how many are in that bunch, and that's it. I move on. No matter if they're all good, they're all long, and I want all of them, I won't pick more than a few. Have you ever woven yucca sandals or uh, anything else of that sort? No, I've not done any footwear. I know my friend weaves them, but I've never sat with her and tried weaving them. She, she demonstrates at our show, but I never have time to sit and watch her because I'm running around. <laughs> so going along, we're almost getting there. And we got another viewer asking, uh, do you use all natural colors or store-bought if you color your, your items? Right now it's a lot of um, store-bought, but I do lose some vegetable dyeing. Uh, it's just the, uh, the process of it, uh, uh, trying to get the colors uh, uh, dark enough to, to uh, Stay and last on basketry, but a lot of um, prehistoric baskets uh, aren't um, that I've, I've been uh, doing aren't um, color dyed. So uh, it's a people are interested actually and uh, your prayers before you pick the plant. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, what it represents? You're, I guess, basically, you're selecting, the, you know, the plants. Um, you're giving an offering, that, you know, the prayers, uh, the, the offering uh, that you give in exchange for you know, you're, you're giving it to one of the plants in exchange for taking the, the life of its relatives. And, and you know, in a kind of um, like apologizing type to... Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think how, how that would translate if you put it into. I know what it is in uh, and how it goes in the in our language, but to uh, explain it and describe it, I guess that that's how it would, it would be. You know, you know the uh, giving giving the plant. Plants um, acknowledgement and uh, that it that you have to take some of them to 
to create the work you're doing. And, and that's why when when we're done with um, we're done with uh, basketry or basketry and stuff, we don't uh, simply gather up everything and throw it in a trash can or throw it in the uh, garbage bag. Uh, it's it's uh, like for me, um, I have a couple big boxes that um, sit next to me, and as I weave and take any any uh, of the stuff off, uh, it's all thrown into that that box. It's all put in there, and then when I go collect yucca, I take that box with me, and I find a, a place to put it all under a tree in an arroyo um, and I tell it to the, the spirit of that plant that's still in it to, to go back to, to, uh, to regrow, to mature. Uh, do you produce pitch, as in pine pitch, pots? Oh, no, um, I've, I've never uh, put um, pine pitch on any of my basketry. Uh, I know Zunis used to um, do a coiled basketry and uh, they would coat the, the outside with pitch. Like, like I said, that was something lost a long time ago. And I'm working at uh, how you process and work with sumac willow to do that, but I've never, I, I haven't gotten a piece big enough to try that with. This is the part that's tough on nails. And are the edges of the stems uh, sharp? Is there any worry of you cutting your fingers? Um, no, because um, when you take the leaves off, uh, you have to pull, um, like I was showing earlier, you have to pull all of the, the uh, clean the edges all the way off, uh, like this to, to get everything off uh, all the way down. So, the, um, not uh, anything sharp on the edges so, to clean them off. And we got another viewer asking, um, is there any medicinal properties of the plant used by the Zuni people? Uh, medicinal, not that I know of, unless you're into chewing on vile, nasty stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the yucca itself, um, when uh, the yucca itself can be processed into um, string, if you roast it or boil it for hours, um, you can process it into, uh, uh, once it's cooked, you can take your, your, your cooked or boiled uh, yucca and uh, your uh, spatula or um, scraper and clean off all of the, the flesh, the epidermis and the flesh until you're left with um, uh, nice fibers, um, which then you can um, spin and twist on your, uh, uh, your thigh. Um, that's where a lot of the, the cordage comes from. Don't have one. But, um. And some of our viewers are just joining in. in um, one of them is asking, did you split your fibers before starting this process? Um, all I did was uh, took a tiny piece off the, the back. Um, that was uh, uh, just to um, get it ready. And um, I, I, I use very little. Um, uh, metal tools. Uh, uh, as you can see here, I um, here's all the my uh, 
basketry tools that I use, uh, my scrapers, small scrapers, all the different um, awls I use. Uh, quite a few of my awls are um, made from uh, deer leg bone. Um, I do have one, uh, uh, this one here that's made from a, a leg of an, uh, a bald eagle. Um, that's for finer, finer work. Uh, the, uh, a really nice awl I use. Talking earlier, I was talking about um, prehistoric style baskets. Uh, this is one uh, that I was working on last night. I didn't get to finish it. But uh, prehistoric baskets were solid on the inside. Um, kind of hard to pick out the designs until you turn it over. Then you have the lines that give you the contrast. Um, this one uh, snakes back and forth over the whole basket. But this, this style, of, uh, prehistoric style of basket, the replica baskets, this is kind of what um, the type of work Zunis were making. The last known baskets made in Zuni were around the 1920s by uh, school kids at the day school, the girls. So it was this style of basket that they were, they were make, making. They weren't splitting the whole yucca all the way through. And all the split sides were always on the bottom and the uh, unsplit sides were on the inside. Um, mats and um, plated baskets uh, prehistorically were done uh, this way. So this is just a, a sample of um, showing replica of that basket. And what other uh, materials or objects can you make other than what you are making now? Uh, the, uh, besides the basketry, um, I also do uh, um, textiles, uh, belts, uh, mantas, um, uh, other things like that. Uh, if you look left of me, you'll see some of my uh, wicker work. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the willow baskets, uh, this is all red willow, um, uh, fruit baskets, bread baskets, uh, um, also do trays, uh, plates, platters, all in the um, wicker style. Now, uh, wicker is fairly new to the Southwest, I think it came in about the 1300s, just prior to um, when the Spanish came. If you look at the, um, the large basket in the back, this one here, that's a more traditional type of uh, uh, basket like that, that's um, done, done with the um, Yucca binding, that's, what, that's the style that would have been uh, pre-contact. A lot of the back weave, uh, the back woven uh, willow baskets with the uh, fancy edging, like all these on the bottom you see are post-contact. That's all uh, European influenced. Now, a common question we get with a lot of these artist demonstrations is what type of music do you listen to while you are creating your work? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm eclectic. It's whatever is on, is on. 
but if you if I really really want to concentrate, then it's uh, um, rigatoon. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what will get me concentrating. And someone wants to know, how many Zuni weavers do you estimate are, uh, are there now? Uh, currently weaving? Yeah. Um, between 10 and 20. Now, if I did this completely from the start, it would have been a couple hours just for cleaning. Mm. <laughs> now, someone wants to see the inside of the ring. Are you possibly able to show that? And this is this is the hard part because once you start, you have to the hand strength involved, and as you you're going all the way, you can't let go. Once you let go, the whole thing will unravel. Well, we're down to the the wire. <laughs> I want to show you guys one of the new new uh, baskets I revived is um, basket about that was made about 850 to 950 years ago. A uh, large number of them were made in Mesa Verde, so uh, we call them Mesa Verde uh, plated ring baskets with a false braid rim. 
So these baskets uh, have this unique um, braid on there, uh, outside of them. So it's a new new addition to the things I make. It's the the volume of baskets I have to make in this style <laughs> for museums and collectors is a lot. <laughs> it was great to be here, share my art my craft and knowledge with you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>